Hey everybody, Mark here from Thailand Connect. Welcome to today's episode. We have uh, the honour and privilege of speaking with uh, Luca Lapenia from Aesthetic Thailand Stone based on the Gold Coast. Um, so yeah, welcome. And um, I won't uh, I won't give too much of a long, uh, hearty introduction. I thought I'd uh, just begin by passing the uh, baton over to Luca and uh, you know welcoming welcoming him to the show and and get him to uh, you know. Give us uh, a background on his um, time in the industry. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, look, thanks for inviting me on. It's an absolute pleasure and honour to be a part of it. And I think, um, yeah, what you've done is is amazing. There's been a bit of a gap in the market regarding some some tiling education and um, some people really speaking about this this type of subject. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to today. Yeah, awesome, man. Yeah, well, look, tell us about your um, background in the tiling industry. I know you've you've got about I think 2007 is when you um, joined um, uh, tiling um, in, in an apprenticeship capacity. And so you're now sort of coming up to 15 plus years experience. So mate, give us, give us everything. Where tell, Take us back to the beginning. How did it all start? And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. So from the very start, it was, um, it was quite interesting. I went to primary school. I was raised by um, an Italian family. My parents migrated in the, um, in the sixties. And um, my grandparents opened up um, a few of the first Italian restaurants on the Gold Coast, actually, which I was I'm born and bred on the coast, which is where I where I still am. And so I grew up in the in the hospitality space, um, sleep, you know, sleeping in the restaurants. The hours are like crazy there, so that's all I knew. My my whole life was that that hospitality space. Um, went to private school, wasn't really an academic. I I didn't really want to I don't know go to university or anything like that. So. Just wasn't on the cards for me. And I dabbled in a few things. I started work very early, probably at the age of, I think, 10 or 11. I got my first job selling mobile phones at Cryer Markets. Mm. Um, and then so from there, I then went to City Beach when I was 13. And then so from 13 to 15, I went to Billabong. And then I worked at Billabong. And then I worked at Coles probably from 16 to 17. And then that kind of takes me through to, to the end of high school and I remember at the time um, during schoolies actually, and I just finished school. I graduated. I think I failed. I'm not sure. I, I got <laughs> I got a, I got a rank. It's not it's not an OP. So even yeah. though I went to private school, I wasn't even eligible for an OP. But I think I did a, a boat building certificate actually that that guaranteed me a certain rank. Um, oh wow! It doesn't matter what my grades were. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I think I passed by default, but I think I should have failed. Anyways, um, <laughs> I I was at schoolies and I got home, and um. I remember kind of standing around and my mum's partner at the time was a, was a Tyler. And um, he was, you know, one of the big guns back in the day, he was competing or quoting up against people like Tile Corp, um, Dave Mullins oh, yeah. and back in the, back in the eighties and the nineties. And he did Brisbane law courts and Roma street uh, train station and a few large jobs. Right. So this is around the time where he was actually slowing down because um, we were getting close to the GFC at that point too, where, yeah. Um, things kind of slowed down a bit for him but he just I was having a beer um and I got home from schoolies and he goes well so what are you doing now and I go well it's school holidays so I'm not going to do anything and he goes <laughs> well you're not at school anymore are you um you need to get a job and I'm like well I'm not going to uni and I don't know what to do and he goes um here's your boots your hard hat you know your your high vis you start tomorrow morning we're going up to Brisbane at the at the time we were doing a um a blood bank in Kelvin Grove, he was doing, I should say. Yeah. And so, and so that was the start of it. It was a week before Christmas and I started work then. So I thought wow. I was having these, you know, six weeks holidays in private school, get longer holidays as well. And I'm, you know, you know, loving it. Um, but yeah, no, we got straight into it and he got me a shovel and we were hand mixing sand and cement. And while they were screening hundreds of square meters of bathrooms and we didn't even have a mixer because he was a tight ass and did things that <laughs> the, the old school way right i was yep. taught by a really yep. really hard guy yep and um and then that was the start of that so i've always been quite motivated individual and i actually took a liking to the trade and i saw the guys tiling and straight away i looked at them and i i was like i can't wait to get to that level and i just mm. really really want to tile yeah so it was my motivation to do things as quickly as I can to learn as quickly as I can to pick up the trade. And come nine months in, he was still, um, you know, 
I wanted to move quickly and he was holding me back and I know why he was holding me back. And um, I ended up going to work for someone else for a year yeah. um, who said, you know, come on board with us and we'll teach you how to tile, which that happened. He did. And then he ended up going bust a year later. And so I went back and finished my trade with Andrew. So I ended up doing probably a total of five years with, with, um, with Andrew and with a break in between. But then when I went back, it, I was I think I was on my second year of my apprenticeship and he just said, you can, you can tile now because you, you know, obviously so motivated and stuff. And, and I think I just picked it up really, really quickly and I was really motivated and I'm, I loved it because ever since when I was a kid, I was just building stuff. I was building Meccano. I was putting together remote control cars from scratch and building these little petrol engines for remote control cars. I was, uh, I just loved everything to do with building. Yeah. And then, yeah, so come to the end of my apprenticeship and I actually had an injury at the gym and um, tore my um, my pec major and had to have some serious surgery and I couldn't pick anything up for six months. So I had six months off the industry. Yeah, it was it was pretty heavy. Mm, sounds painful. It was, yeah. It was it was a, it was a clean snap. It sounded like a towel ripping. A, a towel ripping, and my pec actually hung down towards the bottom of my rib cage because there was nothing else supporting it anymore, and oh. I was I was black from there to, or I should say, from my chest to to my elbow. Mm. Um, and that was a time in my life where I started to question what I was going to do as well because I was like, do I want to continue this? Do I not want to continue this? Or whatever it is, and I dabbled in a few other things. Yeah, but tiling always pulled me back in. Like I don't know what it is, but it was some sort of magnetic attraction to tiling that just kept pulling me in. And in um 2013, that's when I or 2012 2013, I decided to stick it out on Gumtree and just start advertising my own services. Yeah, and then so it all kind of started from there. Um, oh, didn't wow. know anything. Um, didn't know what an ABN was, didn't know what an invoice was. Someone asked me for an invoice in, you know, the first couple of months. And I just said, I don't know how to do that. Like, what is an yeah. invoice? Well, and- back, back, back in around, sorry to interrupt, but back in around those times as well, there probably would have been, you know, there's, there's the, 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 um, the cash jobs, right. You know, so there's a, there's a bit of cash work that goes on on, on weekends and things like that. So it's sort of, you know, it was pretty fairly predominant in you know the trade industry you know in the 80s and 90s and 2000s yeah and it was still quite common i think we're getting close to the cusp of where cash started to die off a bit but i was still in that in that area in that zone and yeah i was doing a few jobs off gum tree and i'd get a job do a bathroom wait seven weeks before the next bathroom came up do that in a few days wait another four weeks and then someone asked for an invoice and I'm like, I don't know how to do that. So I went to a, a news agency and bought like a little, one of those little invoices. Oh, the carbon, the carbon books. Yeah. And I was yeah, trying yeah. to work out how to write <laughs> a bloody invoice. I didn't know what I was writing in there. I was just making up all this stuff. Anyways. Yeah. So look, it, from there, it kind of progressed. At the end of 2013, I kind of won. I learned how to do a quote on a, yeah. on, a on an app. And I won my first good job. It was about eight grand and I had four bathrooms in a really nice luxury home. And with during my trade with Andrew, my apprenticeship, I, I told many, many high-end, many luxury homes. And that's kind of how I learned my trade after Andrew jumped out of commercial and went back into the, the luxury home space. And then in 2014, I hired my first staff member. Um, I dabbled with hiring staff between 2014 and 2016. And I had about five... Um, staff members by 2016, but, you know, zero processes and systems, zero knowledge, didn't know how to lead, didn't know how to manage, didn't know how to um, influence. I just didn't have any skills in that field. And at the end of 2016, um, everyone left, ended up being on my own again. And it was only 2017, which is really not that long ago, where I was actually on the tools by myself. And I actually laid every single tile myself that whole year. Mm. And that was a year when I was kind of questioning, like, I'm a very motivated individual and I always wanted the most out of myself and I didn't feel I was getting it. So I thought, what's, what's my purpose? Like, what's my goal? What do I want to do here? And then, so I ended up deciding I wanted to pull out and started to get my real estate license was going to go into selling basically. Yeah, wow. and, and I was getting ready to wrap up a couple of, couple of jobs and started getting my sales license. And then I got a phone call for a really, really big custom home and um, I still trying to work out what, where my head was at at the time, but it was something about it, once again, tiling roped me back in and I was super excited uh, about this house. It was a massive job. There was two and a half thousand meters of stone to lay in one home. Mm. Um, and it was just me at the time. And then the builder was like, do you want the job? And I was like, 
you know, you kind of fake it till you make it, right? I kind of pretended yeah. that I was like, you know, experience, big company and all that kind of stuff. And I just said, yeah, all right, I'll do it. So I scrapped my real estate license, just parked that to the side. And within, I think it was within four to five months, I was, I had about 10, 10 staff members working for me, but it was, they were all under ABN though, because I hadn't developed a full structure yet. Mm. But that really motivated me to, to build aesthetic. And that was in 2018. And that's when things really kicked off. And, um, and then from then on, it was just trying, failing, trying to build a management team, failing, trying to hire a supervisor, failing, um, trying to build system and processes, failing, getting punched in the face a million times, trying again. And there were so many things that could have taken me out, but I think I'm just stubborn, right? I'm just a business owners are extremely stubborn and, um, I could cop the punches, wanted to quit a thousand times, but just kept trying to go through the motions and ended up employing a business coach four years ago. And yeah, um, wonderful. I guess the rest is history. Yeah, man, that's, um, that's an awesome story. Uh, and thanks for sharing so much information about everything in your past. And, and certainly it, it, it looks and smells like exactly like, you know, what um, entrepreneurs go through when they're creating businesses, right? You know, there's, there's that, that regular, um, experience, failure, experience, failure, experience, failure. Hey, success. Wow. Got there. You know, there's that, that perseverance, that, um, that continual drive to get through the other side and go, Hey, wow. I learned so much from those mistakes and, and I'm so much better for it. Um, and my business and the people that are, um, on the journey are so much better for it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you start attracting some pretty cool people as yeah. well. Yeah. 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 Law of attraction, mate. It's, um, it's pretty incredible. Uh, yeah. that's, that's very cool. Well, yeah. look, you've, you've, um, you've, you've managed to answer a couple of questions in one. So that's awesome. So we can sort of skip a few things and, and move forward, but that's great. Um, I suppose, and you provided some good feedback on the, um, the episode brief, which is great. And one of the questions that I had, um, I wanted to sort of focus a little bit on is sort of what sort of gets you excited every day about the game and tiling and, and, you know, I suppose an extension to that is also um, what um, uh, what is it about, excites you about business, right? That, um, that, that you're sort of using tiling, I suppose, as a vehicle. I mean, you know, you've, you've obviously, yeah, give us, give, tell us more about that. Yeah, I think, um, I think for me, once again, it's tiling kept pulling me back in. And I was always thinking of, I always knew I was going to be an entrepreneur and I always had this, this higher vision of myself um obviously the benefits that come with entrepreneurship but also all the challenges that come with it too um but you know i thought oh, i'll start this business or i'll go to be a real estate agent or i'll go be a developer or whatever i was going to do because i've also bought property and split blocks and flipped houses and i've done that stuff in the last decade but tiling just kept pulling me back in and it's almost like i still struggle to try to actually pinpoint exactly what it is with tiling um, but I think it's just the building components of tiling, starting with absolutely nothing and starting with a vision, let's just say a bathroom. Mm. And it's really up to the creator to try to work out what they want to do in that space. And um, it's almost, it's it's endless. It's, it's, it's the creativity of your brain. But not only do you have to unlock this creative side of your brain to understand what particular product you want in that space, but it takes an absolutely skilled craftsman to execute it. Yeah. And I'm I'm one to dive into big challenges. I'm not scared of big challenges. If anything, I welcome them. So I think the challenging component of tiling is something that I've always been attracted to and I've always welcomed. Um, so, you know, I've always said that to, to, you know, to be a basic tiler is a four to five year, you know, you call it an apprenticeship just to really know the basic skills, but it takes another decade to really fine tune those, those skills to, to apply to many different fields. And even now I've only been off the tools for a couple of years, but the time that I was on for 12 or 13 years, I learned a bit, but there's so much more that my team are executing now that I've never done before. And even, baffles me the stuff that they can do that I've never been able to do. And um, the level of craftsmanship across the different types of um, individuals, depending on their skills and their sweet spots is, 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 yeah, it's just super fascinating, but 
I do get excited about the business component as well. I mean, I've loved building um, a, 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 an organization with with structure, with um, with leadership, with management, with systems and processes. And once you know, in the past, I was extremely resistant to all of those things. Now I've realized the the benefits of being able to build an organization like that, not for me per se, you know, but more so for the individuals that are in it, because we've been able to level up a lot of the individuals within our organization just from Tyler's, but teaching them management skills, teaching them leadership skills, um, into interpersonal skills, teaching them how to deal with um, issues at home better, teaching them how to deal with issues with their, you know, maybe their, their kids better or reactiveness or, you know, whatever it may be across the board. Um, I get a kick out of that type of stuff too. So mm -hmm. the tiling component is great. And I get, I get a kick out of the tiling. I get a kick out of building. I get a kick out of business. I get a kick out of personal development, but I've been able to integrate my life around all the things that I love. And I think with being authentic and once you can jump into this authentic zone, this integration of all of these things together, create this, it's almost like a symphony, like a harmony where you're playing a piano or someone's playing a violin and everything just starts clicking together. Yeah. And um, I, I say, I hope, but I feel that my team feel the same way. I honestly do um, that we're all in the same direction and we're all trying to achieve very, very similar goals. Um, so I get, like you said, what excites you about it? It's the integration of a lot of different things that, that I get a lot of joy out of. Yeah. Yeah, look, I um I remember when we met on site um in your shop on the Gold Coast and I was nearly eaten alive. No, I wasn't really. Um <laughs> puppy puppy's beautiful. Um and um the you 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 spoke we spoke for a little while, but you did share with me at, on that first meeting uh, a little bit about how you um um lead your team uh and the time that you spend with them and the one-on-one -on -one sessions and you know, coaching and encouraging them and and identifying what what do they want to do in life? Like what's their purpose? What's their what you know, how do they want to, how do they want to, you know, how do they want to be in a few years' time and how do they want to be in 12 months? And and you take the time to identify, and um, you share with me, you take the time to identify what what their pathway is so that you can help them get there. Because because some people, as you mentioned, some people just want to be tilers. They don't want to be anything else. So they, they they love the trade, they love getting up every day, they love mixing um, you know, adhesives, they love grouting, whatever it might be. You know, they, they might just love the craft of, you know, creating a really funky design or executing on what customers ask for. So, yep. yeah, that's, yeah. So just tell me a little bit more about that. How does, how, how does, it, do you have like a, a real um, uh, specific system that you use with your, with your team? Is it, a, is it a yearly thing? Tell us, tell us more about that. On like a, on more like a holistic level, it's more so putting people in their sweet spots. Yeah. So everybody has a right to be happy in their own right. And depending on when you're happy, where you're happy in your own right, that makes you successful in your own right. So if someone is really happy going to work and, and laying tiles all day and being an absolute craftsman, and they know that they can maintain that, which is really important because of the body and everything, right? Yeah. They know they can maintain that for a long period of time without doing any kind of long-term damage with heavy lifting, with wearing masks, with wearing earmuffs, with you know all the PPE that you need. And that means that that person is then successful in their own right because that's what they love and that's what makes them happy. Then there's, you know, someone who is doing those duties but is not happy and it is it doesn't really know where to go from here. And um, I've I've seen, I mean, I've I can see someone that is doing the trade but is not exactly into it because they want a little bit more. And it's been great for us to develop this organization, this framework to be able to speak to people and go, okay, well, this is where you are now. What does the next six months or the next 12 months or the next two years look like for you? And what can we do to help you get there? And we've done it a bit in the organization, but it doesn't necessarily happen perfectly on the first go because we might have economical conditions. We might have a plan of action for the business. And in 12 months, we're going to be here and we take a step back because you know, something's happened um, staffing wise or something's happened, happened economic wise, or we might have hit a legal issue or whatever might happen, but the intentions are there. And we've been, we have been successful in elevating people through, you know, through the company and putting people in their sweet spot, I think is really, really, really important because 
when someone goes to work every day, they want to be motivated by the stuff that interests them. Mm. And if you're motivated by the things that interest you, you're going to enjoy the process a lot more. So the first thing I ask um, interviewees who want to be, you know, uh, technicians or tilers, I say, what do you love doing? Do you love laying walls? Do you love laying floors? Do you like screeding or do you like laying pools or cladding or whatever it is? Um, because if I know that, I know that I can put them straight away in a spot where they feel comfortable and yeah. not to say that you're going to be doing that stuff all the time, but at least you're going to be in a spot where it's a bit more favorable to your needs or the things that you love to do. Um, and then, you know, someone might come in and go, look, I'm a tiler, but I want to be a supervisor. I want to learn how to manage. I want to learn how to lead. And I'll go, great. This is how we're going to start. And this is the process for you to get there. Yeah. And um, I think I've, cause then without sounding arrogant, I guess that kind of makes me a bit of a mentor and going, okay, I'm going to kind of mentor you down this process, but I've also got a mentor. I've got three mentors actually, and I've got a, a business coach, a life coach, and a, actually a psychologist. And between these three mentors for me, I've been able to break through a lot of upper limiting beliefs and learn how to break through these, these levels. And my mentors have mentors. And so um, I've what my mentors are teaching me is the diluted stuff that they're getting from their really high up mentors, right? So the stuff that I'm feeding to my team is a diluted, more concentrated, condensed, sorry, diluted and concentrated, it's probably two different things. <laughs> but I should I should actually say concentrated is the word I'm looking for, is yeah, a more yeah, concentrated course. version of everything that I'm learning and I can I can um I can now teach that framework to, to my team. So, um, yeah. And the, look, and the flip yeah. side, flip, sorry to interrupt, but the flip side of that too, <clears throat> the flip side of that too is that you attract um, really good candidates in the future because you've built a reputation around, um, um, I suppose, leading and um, elevating people around you, right? So, you know, when you start looking for, you know, the next apprentice or the next um, tiler or, you know, the, the next experienced tiler, people will go, you need to go and work with Luca. You know, it's, that's just, you know, there's no, nobody else. So you, you, it's, it, it's a pretty excellent um, position to be in. Yeah. Like I'd like to think so. Like that would be nice if, if that's what's been set out in the market. And that's my goal. My goal is to create a culture and to create an environment where, where our team go, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to go anywhere else. Yeah. Like it's just, it's just too good. The opportunity yeah. is good. It's comfortable. You know, there's work-life balance, which is another thing I ne I would love to touch on um, mm -hmm. next because I believe that work-life balance is, is massive for everybody. It's something that I've practiced for many years, yeah. um, which I think is really, really important to, to having a long-term career because like work is great. Don't get me wrong. I have a disgustingly epic work ethic, mm -hmm. but I also have um, a lot of self-respect to create a lot of boundaries in my life to make sure that I'm feeding the right areas properly, including myself first and foremost, yeah. and then my family and my business and, um, you know, the, you know, connections and friends and stuff that come after that. But mm. yeah, I think it's quite really important. And so we, we feed that to our team. We say that, um, you know, we preach family and we preach balance. Mm. So whilst don't get me wrong, I've got, um, five key people in management roles and management roles are salary roles and they're all kinds of hours, right? And I, and I get that. But our goal is to try to make the roles as organised and structured as possible so the organisation mitigates the risk of kind of living in fight or flight or working to an unstructured schedule or, or, or what have you. So... Mm. Uh, that's what we've been trying to implement, but that's the stuff that I've learned through my mentors that I'm kind of passing down. Yeah. So, so it's not all about work, work, work. That's all we do. That's all we talk about. We spend enough time with each other at work. We see each other more than what we see our families. So mm. um, yeah, work-life balance and taking care of yourself is huge. Yeah. Look, completely agree. Well, on that, moving forward just a little bit and, and jumping into one, some other questions that I have here for you today. Um, tell me about, um, some of the biggest mistakes that you've made in your career that have helped you and propelled you to where you are today? I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is one of the biggest mistakes I've made is thinking that I've made it. And I think that's a massive issue. And I've actually seen it with um, previous um, 
uh, team members that I've had who have been also promoted through the ranks and um, have thought that they've made it. And it's a lead by example thing because I've preached that behavior. It's, it's now um, infected into the team as well. And um, by thinking, by thinking that I've made it by winning a project that I've always wanted to win or buying the house that I always wanted to buy or building the team that I've always wanted to build or having a certain number of staff that I've always wanted to have, um, it creates this false level of reality or false level of security where all of a sudden you become content. And then as soon as you become content, that's when, um, you know, God will, you know, kick you up the butt and go, hey, uh, <laughs> I think you really need to pull yourself in because that's not what life is about. Yeah. And um, so having these goals and having these dreams and then achieving them one by one, but in the initial stages, achieving them and thinking that, Oh, great. I've achieved it. That's my job done. Um, has been one of my biggest mistakes. And I've learned now that I think I need to keep and maintain a level of intensity all the time and not sit in a place of, com of complacency. Um, whilst I preach gratitude and contentness, which is super important because if you can't, learn to live in the moment either you'll never be happy and if someone said to me now if your life stayed the same the ways it was now for the rest of your life would you be happy and right now I can comfortably say absolutely I think I'm living the best life I've ever I, I, I could ever live mm -hmm. so I've, nothing's got a hold of me anymore I am still motivated and I'm still um uh you know hustle cultural you know hustle mentality right which I'll never lose because that's my yeah that sits high up in my values. Um, I also can sit back and go, I don't have anything holding me or holding on to me. That's, that's going to, um, you know, uh, create an identity for me that all I think that's going to be an identity for me. Mm. And, um, and that's kind of how I, what I've learned from setting a goal and only being happy when I achieve that, because that's when your feet go up. Because once you achieve that goal, you go, oh, I've done it. Cool. Mm. You know, and then you see how you say what's next, but you don't focus on that. You still don't focus on that particular thing. Yeah. So like, oh, I've got 20 staff now. Great. Cool. Um, I'm just going to kick back and let my ego kick in and my, you know, all of that and just, and just go, Oh, I'm a bit, I'm a successful business owner and stuff. And that's been the biggest slaps in the face I've ever, I've ever received after those, after those types of moments. So I think humbling myself and enjoying the achievements as they come now, but not letting them, um, uh, kind of calcify me a little bit, if that makes sense. They, you know, it's a saying that success blunts you, right? So yeah. the more success you receive, um, the more blunt you are as a person because that's all you're used to. But it's the challenges that actually force you to grow. And mm. and so yeah, I really lean into challenges a lot because of the lessons that challenges can teach you. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome, man. Yeah, like it's um. Where do I pick up? Where do where, where what what do I pick up with there and, and move forward? I'm not sure, but it, look, everything you're saying is um, stuff that's re that that resonates with me. It's things that I've been through in life, and and whilst I haven't been you know on the on the tools uh, full time at all in the tiling trade, you know this business for me in 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 essence the podcast and the things that I've done and the and the companies that I've worked for uh, previously have um, given me very similar experiences. So yeah, look, it's um. Yeah, that's cool. Well, let's let's shift gears for a minute because I really want to. Yeah, you know, there's been some great content so far, and and thank you for sharing too. By the way, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to talk. You you touched a, a few times. You talk. You spoke specifically about tiling being a, a craft, right? And and I've had some um, other tiling contractors on the show previously, and they've spoken about that as well. And about you know, I, I remember Andrew from Too Easy Tiling. Um, in Melbourne, lovely bloke, and he's sort of like, oh, you know, we're the magicians of tiling. And 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 look, I agree. It's you know, there can be some pretty simple tiling jobs. However, you know, depending upon what you're walking into, um, and what preparation's been done, or or how you're tiling, it, it can become complicated very, very easily, right? What yeah. um, where do you think the industry, like the tiling industry, needs to improve? Because I, you know, I'm I'm pretty much in touch with what's going on, but from your perspective, where do you think um, improvement is required? I think um, raising the standards of what people think about tilers. And I understand that every trade, there's a level of craftsmanship involved. Um, but tiling is a very, very um, uh, intricate finishing detail 
of, um, of, of an individual project. And even tilers themselves, I think, across the board need to raise their own self-worth and their own standards to be able to stand up and go, I'm a tiler, but I'm also a magician. I'm also a craftsman. I'm also an artsman, you know, because this stuff is really, really important for, for any tilers out there to feel where, um, you know, a tiler could be perceived as, you know, grubby, dirty, smelly, you know, dust and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But one thing I did with aesthetic early days is really try to emphasize the fact that, you know, we can be um, uh, 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 well-spoken, we can be artists, we can be great people, we can, you know, uh, give back to the community, uh, uh, we can be um, uh, great members of, of, of the society, you know, we can, we can be a lot of different things and not just be seen as, oh, yeah, you know, you're just a Tyler or whatever it is. And you know, that kind of is more so like the the fundamental side of it. And the more technical side of it is the artsmanship of it, if that's even a word, making it, things up it now. Is, it, it is now. It is now. <laughs> let's, let's call it artsmanship, well, yeah, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's, and, you know, it could take someone 10 years to be a good pool tiler. Yeah. And that's just one aspect of tiling. Can you imagine if you became an expert in all fields of tiling how long it would take you it's impossible you can't do it mm. um someone might be good they might be great but i'm talking about an absolute craftsman so yeah look we've tried to preach this level of respect in the tiling industry and that's why um you know our team members wear very nice clothes they wear these black long sleeve shirts with our logos on them or, or gray or whatever whatever we have on site um, you know, we dress well, we speak well, we um, we, we have this level of self-worth that um, isn't commonly recognised in, in the industry. And mm. I think especially in the commercial space, yes, we specialise in luxury homes and that's what those kinds of, um, you know, customers and clients like to see. But even in the commercial space where that's also seen as like extremely fast pace, um, you're just another number, um, all of that kind of stuff, I feel that even uh, in those areas, there can be a bit more of a level of pride and, um, you know, telling someone, what do you do? Be proud mm. to say I'm a Tyler. Like, yeah. because, mate, the the, peop- the things that Tylers have been through through their trade is absolutely phenomenal. And mm. I was fortunate, I'll say fortunate enough to do my trade with one of the hardest bosses in the industry, I'd have to say. And it taught me how to be an amazing Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to toot my horn too much, but you know, I've I've turned out to be a great Tyler, and yeah. I've turned out to be a great manager and a great leader, and you know, leadership and that kind of stuff is is learnt over time. But yeah. um, I think having those kinds of mentors in the industry early on, are, are, you know, are really really good. Mm. So, and and doing my trade through someone that was so tough, I went through a lot, and I learned a lot, and I created a lot of character and backbone and then that then kind of helped me um and helped guide me into you know the journey that i that i went on so for tyler to say that i'm a tyler be absolutely proud of it because the amount of stuff you have to go through to actually get to even just a tyler status after four years is absolutely phenomenal but then Mm -hmm. once you go through that next level which is phase two finish your apprenticeship and then start to learn um, a specific area in the field, whether it might be, you know, mastering bathrooms or mastering stone cladding or or, or tiling pools, whatever it may be, um, there's that's a whole other level of, of of evolution right there as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I just feel that um, there just needs to be more self respect, and the guys or anybody listening to this podcast who's who's in the tiling game, who's in you know their first year of their apprenticeship right through to a, a business owner, whatever it may be just have pride in every single aspect of it because, you know, tilers I think are undervalued a lot in the industry and we need to kind of stick up for that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, it Taking pride in your work is really important, um, particularly in a finishing trade, right? Because you, you are the last people on a job site. Um, it's what's seen. It's what, you know, it's what people, um, it's what customers customers have this vision of what their their tiled area is going to look like and you guys are the ones actually they're putting it together and making it look amazing and not only that it's it's also something that usually i mean if if you look back in um early um bc days and you and you see some of the 
the amazing tiling work that they uncover in sort of, you know, in the Roman Empire and overseas in Europe. And it's been there for like thousands of years and it's meticulously placed, right? So, and, and, and they've done a lot of work. And back then, you know, they didn't have the, the luxury of having, you know, 24,000 different adhesives to choose from. It was just, yeah. it was just mud, right? So, but, but, it, but it's still there today. So um, taking pride in your work is so important. And I think um, from what I see as well is that, um, you know, if, if I'm going to answer the question that I've asked, um, taking shortcuts in tiling work is never a good, um, never a good choice. Um, you know, there, there's always someone paying for that work. And, and as you know, the, the charging for tiling installation is not, um, it it's, can, can be competitive, but it's also a very, um, it's, 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 it's a luxury um, price that you pay for, you know, generally really high quality work. I mean, a bathroom can cost 15 to 20 to 25 grand on average um, yeah. today, you know, so um, taking shortcuts really needs to be one of those things that you, you just don't even contemplate when you're, doing some tiling work yeah and it's hard because then you know a lot of times you get into these spaces and you're fixing other people's mistakes and i don't want to you know um you know say shit on the industry if you will oh, no. for the lack for the lack of a better word but mm. the tilers are there and the tilers are the ones that are held accountable for the end product if a builder's wall is out of level and we follow the builder's work we're going to get done for it and yes. it's always on us and we'll get blamed for it because as part of the Australian standard state, if we've tiled a substrate, it means that we've accepted it. And if we've accepted it, now we're going to help be held accountable for it. So tilers do get the shit end of the stick. Yes. And that's what really does affect the way work is with is executed. And especially when you have someone with the wrong mentality who is not motivated about the tiling trade itself, there are probably going to be some shortcuts here and there. But, you know, we've just had to cop it. We've just had to accept it and just let go and say, look, we are that final trade. We are the mm. trade that's going to fix, you know, eight months of building works, basically, if if it gets to that. I'm not yeah. saying that's all the time, but, you know, on those types of, of jobs. So if we take a shortcut at that point in time, it just can be a flow-on disaster. And it's better to slow down, take your time. One of the biggest things I do with my team is just say, if you're uncomfortable about something, just don't do it. Mm. Don't. Don't tile it and come back and say, oh, it was a little bit out. So I just, you know, just I made, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. make a phone call, make the builder aware, make the customer aware. We try to, as much as we possibly can, bring the the client through the process and say, hey, your wall's out, whatever it is, six mil. Do you want us, if we make it plumb, you know, we've got to pack out this much by the time we get to the top. Yeah. What do you want to do? You know, and then we're not scared to raise variations or anything like that because we know our self worth. Mm. But one of the biggest tips that I would recommend is is make sure you raise your variations before you start them because yeah. you're gonna try to raise them at the end. You're never getting paid for them. So and no, and, and, and and the builders don't have a right to pay you either. So yeah. get your systems and processes right from the get go, and um and you won't have any issue. And you'll also gain a lot of respect, I think, in in the industry. But That'll that'll help you be more comfortable with, um, I guess, looking at something and going, should I take that shortcut or not? Mm. Because you can go, oh, look, I'll go work in another area first. I'm going to raise this with this particular person and just say, what do you want to do here? And have a frank conversation. It's not about taking anything personally. It's just about this is our issue. Let's get to a solution. Yeah. And, and the key being communication, right? It's communicating with all the relevant parties right throughout the process um, beginning, middle, end, and then probably sometimes in between those spaces as well, so that yeah. everyone's on the same page. Because you just you develop really good relationships with your clients, with your builders, and then when they get the phone call, they're like, "Oh, okay. So what's the challenge? What do we need to do? Uh, where are we at?" It's when you get to the end of a job and you don't raise anything throughout the course of um, operating, and then you go, "Oh, but there was these four things that caused us issues throughout the job." It's like, well. Why didn't you say something? Yeah, don't. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. And that's what, you know, being in both sides of it, being a one-man band for many, many, many years and then now running an organisation, I've seen both sides of the fence. And, you know, one of the biggest issues I had when I was tiling on the tools myself doing everything is making those phone calls because I just had an end goal in mind and I just needed to get the job done because I needed to get to the next one. And yeah. that's 
one of the hardest things to for someone, and I, I can I can relate and I can sympathize to anybody in that position, that it's not that easy to just sit back and go, all right, I'm gonna raise this and go do something else, because there might not be a something else. Mm. You know, and you might need, you know, to send an invoice by this day or whatever it is, but try to break through that level of thinking and actually start thinking professionally and going, no, this is the way we're gonna do it, you know, and make sure you get everything on paper. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's cool, man. Um Again, uh, look, love to know a little bit more about aesthetic tile and stone and um, the, the the tile supply. That, that there now, I know you aesthetic tile and stone has been around for since around about two thousand and twelve. I think is yeah. that yeah. Um, tile supply is new, uh, newer, yeah. new newer part of your business. Um, tell us about a bit more about tile supply and tell us about how you market your businesses like how do you go to market and what what sort of platforms you're using social media websites word of mouth um print you know might still be out there i'm not sure um, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so, yeah um sponsorships yeah tell us a bit tell us about that yeah so um aesthetic tile and stone is obviously our installation company and we've had that for about 10 plus years it's still going strong um it's it's growing uh we've we've focused the last couple of years on really dialing in the systems and processes and um leadership and management teams um and that's uh yeah look it's been absolutely amazing um being involved in aesthetic for for a number of years and for a few years now but had an idea to um, open up a tile shop and an online store and it's always been on the cards but um, I was so focused on other things in the past it, I wasn't ready I, and I hadn't earned the right to start this second business until I knew that it was um, and until I earned the right until I've, I've found the right time and space to be able to do it without for starters without neglecting aesthetic because aesthetic mm -hmm. is what's brought me to where I am today and um, the last thing I want to do is is, is, is compromise that so being able to juggle the time to start a second second business completely separate business with separate staff and everything else I needed to make sure that aesthetic was absolutely solid and our clients were still being served at a very high level and our teams weren't being compromised because the time that I needed to then go and do the other business um, you know would pull me away a little bit from aesthetic mm. um, but I wanted to make sure that I had the right team around me to do it so we've been able to do that we've been able, been able to build a phenomenal team uh, within aesthetic and I'm just really, really proud. Just can't say it enough. I'm just proud of everybody in our organisation. So um, if they're listening, you know, totes to them for being able to allow me the space to do things like start the tile supply, which um, it's a tile supply business. And um, we, we've got a showroom on the Gold Coast and we've got an online store with about 3,000 tiles on the website. So our nice. goal is to be um, one of, well, I should say, Australia's largest online tile shop um, we've got massive goals we've got massive aspirations everything that we're doing in the tile supply directly benefits aesthetic tile and stone as well it's it is honestly a match made in heaven we can scale aesthetic faster than we ever thought we could because of the tile supply you know i mean it's, it's natural right it's organic people come in and buy tiles they need tilers where yeah. obviously the best people that we're going to recommend aesthetic is right yeah. and, and and then vice versa aesthetic then feeds work through our organic database that we've developed over the last 10 years um you know can feed you know leads and and and, and, and you know marketing material down uh you know to the tile supply so um you couldn't pick a better um uh collaboration between two completely separate businesses and um so yeah the tile supply i've had um uh, uh jenny who's my general manager uh, for the tile supply now, she's was with Aesthetic for um, three about two two years, and she helped me build all the systems and processes within um, within Aesthetic. Oh, and this is probably another point I should make: always hire people better than you. That is one of oh, the yeah. best <laughs> things I've learned yep. ever in my life is hiring people better than you because I would never be able to do what, or be where we are today in the businesses without having people that have more knowledge than me in their in their mm. fields, including our, you know, project manager on on with aesthetic tile and stone and just run run it way better than what I can. Yeah. But it's it's good because it's it's created this this symphony, this collaboration of, you know, all these heads having different ideas based on previous experiences and whatnot. And then so, so with Jenny systemizing, helping us systemize aesthetic. Um, she's then moved over to tile supply and been able to, she's done most of the work in building that business out. 
And then so now the tile supply um, is operational. We've got um, a national sales director who's been um, in the business for about 15 years selling tiles and he's absolutely phenomenal and yeah, and cool. so good at what he does. And then so it's basically me, Jen, and and um and Ben that are that are firing on the tile supply at the moment. And the tile supply doesn't actually take up too much of my time because I'm still very, very hands-on in aesthetic because that's what I love. I've actually held on to um, you know, the sales and the estimating side of things. Um, I love that side of it, hustle culture, back to that. Yeah. I like meeting people. I like talking to people and, yeah. and I like, so that side of it. And then, so with aesthetic, the way we've been able to, to market ourselves is, is, is mainly organic. So it's just been doing a job, you know, getting a recommendation or repeat work or whatever it may be. Um, on our socials, we have tried to be a little bit more um, professional and systemized with our social media posting. So try to get a couple of posts out a week from previous jobs, um, mm -hmm. maybe some progress photos of some jobs, um, I think a good advice for anybody out there is is uh, who's trying to build a business is uh, hiring a good media team, and we've been able to hire um, a pretty good media team who's been able to 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 do a lot of videos and and um, and pretty show, like pretty much showcase everything that we're doing, and we've chopped them down into like you know little you know reels and bits and yeah. pieces. And it's made it's it looks like from a front end aesthetic it looks great, but on a back end it runs really well as well. So. Yeah, cool. um, that's been great on that front. And then so with all of the organic leads and um, customers that Aesthetics had over the last decade, it's natural for the tile supplier to to latch onto those and start making phone calls and and try to see if we can get any of those people interested in um, in getting some tile sales across the line. And that's where we've really um, hit the ground running with Aesthetic, uh, sorry, with the tile supplier because Aesthetic has been um, has developed that, that database over the last few years. And mm. I think with the marketing side, anything online is just so important for both businesses, um, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, you know, uh, uh, LinkedIn. Um, we don't do email, uh, email, uh, mail outs, I should say. We haven't done any of those yet or newsletters. But there's a lot of things in the cards that we're going to start doing soon. Mm -hmm. um, but from a marketing point of view, it's been very basic, no paid ads. There hasn't been, um, it, you know, anything out of the ordinary outside posting a phone of a job that we say this is what we do maybe posting a video saying hey this is what we we're up to last month yeah. um i'm not shy to get on the phone so if i drive past the job site and i see a banner up and builder i've never heard of i'm calling them straight away that's just um i think that's important you know yeah. if you if you're trying to build build out it's good day good dna to have mate you see something on the side <laughs> of the road and you go haven't spoken to that person before i'll just give them a ring <laughs> yeah and even if they don't need anything you've had a good chat you know so yeah absolutely yeah. That's cool, man. Um, love it. Uh, the um, well, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, we've obviously been through some pretty challenging times, you know, the past few years, and um, the pandemic certainly threw a spanner in the spanner in the works for a lot of people um, in many different ways. But without sort of focusing too much on that, um, has your business evolved? Um, dramatically or significantly during that time post pandemic, um, have think uh, ha, 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 were things different or were, were they the same? What what happened for you guys? Yeah, that, that hurt. COVID really hurt. Um, I um, I was in a I was in a pattern of with aesthetic because tile supply wasn't around at the time, and um, I was in a pattern of you know winning the work and doing the work and not really understanding how a pipeline of work flows. And yeah. then so once I would win all this work, I would then stop quoting and I would then, then it'd have a flow on effect three months later. Um, but I used to be able to pick it up pretty quickly because I'm once again, I'm not shy to get on, on the phone. So we'd do all this work and then I'd find myself having no work for whoever team members we have on board. And I'd get on the phones and I'd pick up jobs quite quickly. Um, in May, 2020, we, it, that was at that point where we'd finished a lot of the jobs that we'd been on and I hadn't been quoting because I was just spoiled for work and work was just coming across the plate. And then all of a sudden it was, oh, we're down to sending, you know, six guys home and we've got two guys on the field now. And, and that was really, really tough. And it was, it was another, you know, another one of those punches in the face to go, you know, how we got the right amount of cash flow to fund this and, and, you know, to cash flow this over the next, you know, whatever it is, because I was calling all of these builders and all of these customers to try to get on a job and everyone's saying, mate, we've just stopped work. We've even stopped to build halfway through because we don't know if the world's going to go 
through through a pandemic or whatever's going to happen. So mm. it was really, really hard times. And I think that was a period of time where I kind of reevaluated and I went, I need to change my, I need to change the way I do things and the way I see things. Mm. And then so then I, through coaching as well, I developed um, an understanding on how to build out a pipeline successfully with, you know, we're booked out three months in advance, we're booked out four months in advance or whatever it is and learning how to fill holes where I can. And um, I think that's been the biggest game changer for me because it adds a level of like security and comfort knowing that, you know, we've got X amount of employees and we're booked out X amount of time in advance. And when that pipeline starts to reduce down um, time-wise, then I know I need to, you know, get on the phones or we need to start making those phone calls again to get that pipeline filled back up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the biggest mistakes in that field is when you win all this work, you think that's it. I want all this work. I don't need to do anything else, but it's one of the biggest misconceptions ever when you're at your busiest, that's when you should be quoting the most because those busy times are about to fall into a, a lull or come to an end and you mm. need something to go on to as well. Um, and one of the other things was relying on one or two big builders. That was one of the biggest mistakes I've made as well. So whilst um, I'm very, very grateful for, um, those particular builders that provided us with those kinds of work and and added a layer of security for us for a long period of time when the work dried up with those builders and we were kind of left twiddling our thumbs going, what do we do? So I've also learned how to spread my um, uh, my client base and customer base across all different types of uh, um, uh, different types of people, if you will, from you know mum and dads to builders to to developers to you know private clients and strata and you know mm. body, body corporates and stuff like that. So, so um, there's always kind of like a really nice balance of different types of people across the pipeline, and that's what COVID taught me was to make sure that um, you know diversification of business is is extremely important because you want you spend all this time building a team you spend all this time building your management team your site supervisors your your senior technicians you know your TAs and you've you know you've spent so much time developing a um, a trade assistant to be a tiler and all of a sudden all that can come to an end if you haven't managed your pipeline properly and mm. you know when you've got 20 staff you you need to make sure that you've you, you know that's consistent there's work every single day for them yeah. Um, because otherwise you put all this time into developing these roles and there's, you know, at the end of it, you're going to go down to, oh, sorry, guys, we don't have any work for, for a month. Mm. Uh, so I think COVID um, uh, kicked me up the butt with that and to learn yeah. new ways of managing aesthetic and managing aesthetics pipeline to suit the level of um, the level of staff we have. And now we don't, we don't really manipulate our staff too much according to the jobs we have. So we, we won't, I won't go and take on a big job if I know that we don't have the capacity with our staff because I'm not going to go out and hire five people in one hit. That's, yeah. you, you know, because we do, we spend time developing roles. So I would rather not win jobs and just hold back a bit and say, no, like I'm not going to build this team out because it's not the right time yet and make sure that our team is comfortable and know what they're doing rather than hiring five guys, getting to the end and then having to sack five guys and going, you know, it's, mm. it's it's kind of this up and down cycle, and I don't like that. It's predictability, it's it's consistency, and it's you know making sure that we have that flow running running through the business. And starting the toll supply was another reason. Back to your question, what have we really changed? The toll supply really started because I said it was actually a year ago, a year and a half ago. <clears throat> big wave of COVID, another big wave of COVID came through. And everybody got it in one hit and half our team was at home and it was just nuts. And I said, I need a way to mitigate our risk. And I need a way to, um, uh, you know, have one business being able to fund the other if shit goes down or the other one fund the other if shit goes down. And and because aesthetic is such a labour heavy business because we're installing tiles, mm. um, I said, I need something to offset that to to mitigate our risk and not necessarily to you know, cash flow one business, but also if people are walking in through the tile supply and they're wanting to buy tiles, well, they're going to want installs done as well. Mm -hmm. So that mitigated our risk as well of having this pipeline and having to keep this pipeline so full and the pressure of it, aesthetic adds that layer of protection. Oh, sorry, the tile supply adds a layer of protection to aesthetic to be able to keep that pipeline nice and consistent. So once again, it's that symphony, it's that piano, it's that violin, it's that mm -hmm. harmony that kind of helps feed all the businesses um, also 
I should say both businesses um, with the with the correct you know pipeline of work, and then you can make strategic decisions on the back of that. You can go, all right, well, we know exactly where we sit. We know we can fill out our pipeline this far in advance. We know the toll suppliers funding aesthetic with work as well. Um, do how big do we want to grow aesthetic this year? Mm-hmm. Or what's you know and you know what's the goal for the um, you know the the team our team within aesthetic because then it's all about strategic plays now and go okay well we want to get from here to here by in twelve months what do we need to do to get there all right we need to add another team what does that look like we need to add a site supervisor two technicians and two TAs yeah. and then so everything starts to become <clears throat> very planned and very strategic on your on your growth and then that's when you can start to scale but s- scale with um, confidence and scale safely. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Wow, man, you uh, you're a natural at this, right? You know, just sharing all this information. I really love it. Um, it's been really cool today, and and thank you again for sharing because I, you know, there's there's so much to learn from other people's experiences in life, and offering what you guys offer uh, in terms of uh, uh, an, an installation business, which is where uh, are the grassroots of where you came from. Um, in learning tiling and, and in installation and then being able to apply, you know, another business arm with the tile supply later on is is a real, um, it's a real modern way of looking at things, right? And and today, customers are becoming more and more time poor. Um, and, and that's been going on for a number of years now since social media began and, and life started to fasten, become life, living life became faster because we're so more connected with all of the information. People want to want to be able to go and have a shopping experience where they can choose some tiles, feel comfortable about the decisions that they've made, and then in, and in the same breath go, how do we get these installed? Um, and the tiling industry has always been, in the past, has always been an industry where you go into a tile store, you select some tiles, get some amazing service, hopefully, um, and then you'll go, oh, I need someone to install the tiles and you'll get some business cards over the counter and there'll be recommendations. And then you've got to try and get, you know, one of three or four people actually on the phone. Um, and, and a lot of times people are busy, right? If they're independent sole traders and they don't have apprentices or laborers with them, it's very difficult to get them on the phone during the day and then to even get them out to the house. So you've, um, you're certainly on a, 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 um, a winning path um, with having those businesses together. So well done, man. Awesome. Thank you. I hope so. We'll see how it goes. But look, we we are quite confident that things are going to take off. It's been <clears throat> a lot of investment. There's uh, a lot of stress, a lot of sleepless nights. There's been a lot of things happening, and there you know there still is, and it's never ending in business. You know you can't be naive to what the business world actually looks like. But you know it's all in 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 hope for a for a kind of a bigger harmonious goal a, a goal across you know many many different legacies. Yeah. Cool. Well, mate, um, look, I'm going to wrap it up today with, um, we haven't done the final uh, fast track questions for a while and and I wanted to um, kick it off again for 2023. So you've been kind enough to uh, handpick some for me, which is awesome. I like that. Um, so let's do that. And then uh, let's find out how people can connect with you post the uh, episode today. Um, yep. So let's start with question number one, right? What does your morning routine look like? Okay, so morning routine is uh, four fifteen. <coughs> excuse me, four fifteen a.m. Wake up. Um, I meditate for ten minutes. I then have a green tea. I um, oh, sorry, I have a hydrolyte and a green tea because you sleep, you get dehydrated. Um, so I have a hydrolyte, then I have a green tea, um, and then I'll you know do my thing and get ready. And I'm in the gym, so I'm in the gym by five o'clock in the morning. Probably train till about six six thirty ish. Um, I come home, I'm quite organized and regimented in, in my lunch. So I make, you know, three meals, my kind of breakfast, you know, mid morning, you know, mid lunch kind of thing. And, and, uh, and two o'clock in the afternoon, which is, it's all healthy stuff. I'm, I'm an extremely healthy person. I don't drink, I don't do anything. So um, it's all wrapped around, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of vitamins, a lot of protein, um, you know, a lot of veggies, a lot of fruit. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so that's what my lunches are made up of, and they're quite similar every day. Uh, we go down. Um, I probably get to the office around seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, and that's when my day kind of kicks off. Um, I've been able to develop this this balance though. So when I'm at work, I'm on, and 
you know, when someone goes to work, say, you know, 11 or 12 hours a day, they get a certain amount of stuff done. I can get the same amount of stuff done in 70 hours. I'm extremely efficient and I'm extreme, extremely present in everything I do. Um, I usually start to shut down or wind down probably around three o'clock, three thirty. Yeah. Um, I'm still on call until probably five, five thirty though, but not actively working. And I recently I've been going to the magnesium baths and saunas. So I have a I do hot and cold plunge and yeah. I do and, and I do sauna, and that's probably four or five days a week I do that as well. Um I cook, so dinner's at home and it usually consists of like a protein or something of the likes. Um, yeah, I don't cool. mind my TV time. I play PlayStation. I'm a massive PlayStation <laughs> fan, right? Yes, you can be an entrepreneur and you can be a gamer at the same time. So yeah. screw what everyone else thinks. I, I love it. <laughs> as long as as long as there's a right balance of consumption and entertainment, right? So you obviously yeah. you want to you want to be you probably 80 20 rule, right? So 80 percent consumption, 20 percent entertainment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it you know it feeds me and it relaxes me and it's something that yeah. really works with me. So, but yeah. look, I spend um, time with Helena, who's my wife, and we you know we spend that kind of we finish dinner around six and I'm in bed by you know eight kind of eight thirty, knocked out up again at four. So that's usually yeah, cool. the, the routines like nice mate excellent well done I've, I've i've written some notes up here um i'll apply a few of those things i like i have a very similar routine but it's not about me today um <laughs> so uh you've obviously got two um growing and successful su- successful businesses today um park that for a minute if you could um, start your own business uh, another business tomorrow what would it be this one's this one's a tough one because what I've learned, <clears throat> what I've learned in business can be applied to to anything. Um, I think the framework stays the same across businesses. It's um, you know finding finding great support in administration. It's finding great people that know their trade. It's finding great technicians that execute. Um, it's learning how to uh, you know develop a leadership and management style within the business to make it grow. So what I've learned can be applied to anything. But if I had to remove what I'm doing now and go into something else, um, it would be something where I'd look for as a niche, something that's um, uh, more of like a niche market and that hasn't really been done before. Mm. Um, I come up with business ideas all the time, and you're putting me on the spot, and I can't think of one now. <laughs> but- okay. But it's anything in like a niche market and yeah. and probably towards the e-com, um, potentially in the e-com space um, to to like scale and systemize online, something in like an online business, because I really think that's where that's where things are going to be moving towards is, is towards the online space. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Uh, who's been your most professional mentor um, since you started, you know, getting into that space? Yeah. Um, Probably my my wife banging at my head every day telling me that I need to change. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And yeah. you know, she's been a, a massive instrumental part of my growth. You know, no one um I haven't never been challenged in my life like like she's challenged me. And 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 like we spoke about earlier, Mark, you know, she's in the psychology space and she's got a therapy business and um in the NDIS field. And um it's the stuff that I never really tapped into early days. And mm. um she's really helped me change um what I thought my reality was and and and, and you know my perception of things and and you know, I, I kind of question, you know, a lot of the things that I do now and all the things that have been holding me back in the past because she's helped me create a level of awareness mm. around um, a lot of my upper li- limiting beliefs and whatnot. But That's look, cool. having a, a strong woman by your side is 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 absolutely massive and I feel I've got that. And I've got a business coach, I've got a life coach and I've got a, a psychologist as well. And I think that the stigma around psychology is something that needs to be discussed because I don't have a psychologist because I need to go, otherwise I'm going to fall apart. Um, it might have been that in the past, um, but now I go see a psychologist as a mentor. So I look at my year and I go, what do I want to do this year? And, and to speak personally, um, if I may, my, my big thing this year is to improve, yeah, improve my empathy and, um, and to learn how to be more emotionally available to, to, to the, you know, my close people around me and, and, you know, my, my team as well. And, um, something that I've struggled with a lot in the past is 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 empathy and 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 you know expressing emotions. So I went to my psychologist and I just said this year I want to learn how to be more empathetic and how to um, be more emotionally available, especially for Helena, because I know that I'm not filling my, her cup as much as I should be as a husband. So I think mm. it's really important to to view where we can improve. And if nothing changed now, 
Um, and if I didn't do anything now, you know, lives will be good. You know, nothing would really collapse or anything, but I'm not settling for good. I want to settle for great. So I'm going to go seek these mentors out that are going to help me elevate to this, this great level. Mm. And, um, and yeah, that's why I, I see my psychologist and I don't, you know, do, I look at her as a mentor because she's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Excellent, man. That's, it's, uh, Yeah. Terrific. I mean, I remember uh, a number of years ago, I was listening to Richard Branson's um, uh, audio book, the, the Virgin Way. It's one of the, one of the many, many books that he's done. And uh, he talks specifically about a time when he was um, developing the name for um, the record company. And I, and I can't look, I'm, I'd be lying if I said I could recite the entire version of the, the event but it was about how he was choosing ver the name Virgin versus the name something else. And I'd have to go back over the audio book again to remember it specifically. But I remember him talking to his, um, it might've had something to do with the cola or something. And he was, he the, the moral of the story was he, he always um, consulted his wife um, and his family when they were around, when he was making decisions on business and on things that he does, because he knew that the impact of the things that he does in business reflect the you know things that occur in his personal life. So what better voice to have than your partner, partner in crime, you know, yeah, and, and, and they, and they, you know, you don't always necessarily have to take their advice on board, but they're going to give you a pretty sobering look at some of the decisions that you make. And they're going to go, really you want to call something virgin cola like is that really what you want to do <laughs> because yeah. because you think it's a great idea and you go oh well my, my god this is awesome it's amazing I've, I've come up with this concept and you know ego takes over and all of a sudden you go oh, i'm just going to go and do it and then but if you don't get some counseling and coaching around that and, and engage with people that that live with you 24 7 um yeah. you can make some um some shitty decisions <laughs> yeah exactly and, and it's i think it's really important to <clears throat> create a safe space for that person to be able to give you feedback as well because there's a lot of times where um people haven't be able to create create that safe space so mm. you might ask someone for advice and then they'll tell you something and then you'll get defensive and you'll get offended and you know you'll get all up in your your own grill but it's learning how to remove yourself away from the picture and learning how to not take things personally and create that safe environment for someone to be able to turn around and actually say what they think without fearing, um, you know, the reaction in return. And, you know, that's been a massive thing for me to learn over the last few years because I wasn't necessarily the greatest person to create a safe space, you know, five, six years ago. But over time, I've learned how to slowly you know, hopefully now I feel that I create a safe space for people. And that's when people really truly can come to you and say, this is what you're doing wrong, or this is what you can improve on, or this is what I think about your virgin, you know, a, a name idea, yeah. you know, and not, and not fear, um, you know, the other person getting offended or defensive or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, mate, You've been incredible today. You've shared an enormous amount of information with us. We, I really appreciate you being on the show and I'm, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people that listen to this episode are going to um, have some, they're going to really love hearing um, you know, what we've been talking about today. And I think um, in conclusion, I'd just like to sort of um, reach out to you and say, hey, look, how do, how do people, how do the audience connect with, with Luca Lapenia, with aesthetic tile and stone with the tile supply what's the best way for them to reach out and connect with you yeah so like in its simplest form you can find me on on instagram uh which is <clears throat> just my full name uh, no dots or underscores or anything it's l-u-c-a and l-a-p-e double n-a luca la penna awesome. and um, on that um you'll see two links on my bio to both businesses and then so you can click over and find the businesses from there you know in the same token i'm on linkedin luca la penna and on facebook as well so that's the best way to uh, to reach out. Awesome, mate. Well, look, we'll uh, we'll absolutely uh, have that in all of the show notes uh, when we uh, go live with the episode. And again, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. We'll probably probably run a little bit longer than 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 envisaged, but that's what happens when you know great conversations occur. And um, I really appreciate you uh, sharing um, your um, history in the industry and and look forward to um, you know some some pretty awesome stories in the future. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Look, it's an honor to be on the show. Um, you know, when you asked me, I was kind of a bit gobsmacked 
Um, you know, we don't, sometimes we don't feel worthy to do stuff like this, but look, I really appreciate you recognizing that and you're doing some amazing things. And I think that once again, this is what the industry really needed is, um, is, 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 uh, is a podcast and is education on, on, on other people and what other people are doing in the industry. So I think you're going to make some, um, some big moves, Mark. So thank you for everything that you do. And yeah, it's been a pleasure. Mate, you're very welcome. Thanks again. Have a, uh, have a fantastic day, buddy. Cool. Thank you. See you, pal.